All right. Welcome, everyone, to our um, sixth Ignis our sixth Ignis webinar, and our first webinar that highlights the good work of our faculty learning communities. So. Just very quickly, um, I just wanted to give a few highlights of Collaborate. And it look, I think most of us in here are probably pretty familiar with Collaborate, but Alyssa Sells, my e-learning counterpart, and I have created um, some slides that just sort of walk people through um, Collaborate. And if everybody could just use an emoticon um, right now, you know, just to try it out, a smiley face, a laughing out loud, give some applause, some confusion, some disapproval. <laughs> I think it's, it's kind of nice. And I'd like to encourage you to use these. Um, you know, if something's confusing, if you want, if someone's going too fast, if someone's going too slow, um, I'd just like to encourage you to use these um, emoticons. Um, so the chat is fairly simple, you know, type in. And um, the whiteboard tools are kind of fun. So if everybody could um, hover on to, um, sorry, to the left of their screen, um, if you could point to the sun icon and click on that. For the first activity, um, I'm, we're going to find ourselves on the map. So if everybody could put a nice, bright um, sun on, their, um, on the map and show us where you are, that would be great. Excellent. It's always fun. And I see Greg is joining us from Oregon. <laughs> Greg, we'll have to make a bigger map <laughs> so we can include you. OK. So and now we'll just do a quick little poll. Um, so if you um, if you could indicate whether you are sorry not now I'm trying to remember how to do a poll um, for the polling. There we go. So if you could um, take a second. Are you full-time faculty? Are you part-time faculty? Are you an administrator? Are you staff? Are you other? Excellent. And Amber is in Nebraska, so she's <laughs> Amber. You're you're really off the you're really off the map there. Okay, good. So um, it's just kind of fun sometimes to play around a little bit with Collaborate because it can be a very useful a very useful tool. And I also want to welcome Amber Goulart, our Blackboard Collaborate rep, um, who is here today. Um, and she has been such a faithful supporter of this webinar series. So Amber, I, wait, wait, wait for it. I applaud you. <laughs> so thank you so much, Amber. Um, so we do, um, you know, we, there's um, lovely emoticons. Uh, raise your hand so we can call on you using emoticons. Um, and when it's time for the Q&A, um, you can either type your chat, your question into the chat window, or you can click on talk. Um, okay. It looks like um, some. It looks like oh, teleconference. So it looks like Joe has joined us. It looks uh, the Tacoma folks have joined us via teleconference. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no worries, no worries. So we're we're just walking through the fun um, the fun collaborate sessions, and so we're glad to have you with us. So yeah, before, yeah? sorry, we have no we have no screen, so we have no way of seeing what slides you are putting up. But Mary just said a bug is a bug. So. <laughs> that will make sense. When yes, absolutely. Um, so. When we when we get to your presentation, perhaps Amber can give us some tips on on how best to facilitate that that piece of it. Sure, um, well, I can I can also you know tell you what the creative intent was, and then you can sort of go with it. But I think Mary is right. A bug is a bug. <laughs> Absolutely. So before we begin, um, I.
just wanted to go over a little bit about a what a faculty learning community is. And I've taken, and, and Joe and Mary, you won't be able to see this slide, but um, the rest of you will. It's from the Miami FLC model. And oh, um, Amber is saying that you should launch the mobile version on your phone or tablet to see the slides. Um, um, well, neither of which do we have. Okay. All right. Well, we'll 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 just wing it. We'll just wing it. I just want to make sure we don't get too far behind. So, so we've had to move um, to many venues today, um, Jen. So we're just here with the phone is our only technology. Okay. <laughs> we'll we'll work it out. Um, and it just looks like Christy um, and the Highline folks just joined us. So we are in. So. A faculty learning community, um, I told Bill I wouldn't read the slides, <laughs> but since some folks can't see them, <laughs> um, it's, it's active, collaborative, and it's an active, collaborative, year-long program. Um, participants collaboratively build a curriculum about enhancing teaching and learning, and they participate in frequent seminars and activities that provide learning, development, transdisciplinarity, the scholarship of teaching and learning, and community building. An FLC can do a range of things. Um, you can select a focus course or a project um, to try out innovations, assess student learning, prepare a course or a project, um, or a, project a mini portfolio to show the results. You can engage in tri-weekly seminars, um, possibly even retreats. Uh, that frequently, they involve work with students. And you can present project results to the campus and, to, um, and at national conferences. Evidence shows that FLCs increase faculty interest in teaching and learning. And they provide safety and support for faculty to investigate, to attempt, to assess, and to adopt new methods. Today, we're going to see an example of a cohort-based FLC from Highline Community College. Um, this is, Kate will present on their model. And they addressed, um, this is, it addresses the teaching, learning, and developmental needs of an important cohort of faculty or staff that has been particularly affected by isolation, fragmentation, stress, neglect, or chilly climate in the academy. Their curriculum often involves, a, um, includes a broad range of areas and topics topics of interest to them. We're also going to see examples of topic-based FLCs. And in these, you design a curriculum to address a special campus or divisional teaching and learning need, issue, or opportunity. So, um, so we'll, be, we'll be sort of learning about this by example. And um, without further ado, um, oh, I, I, yes, without further ado. Sorry, that's a slide that is coming later. So, <laughs> so without further ado, we're going to start with Mary Fox and Joe Monroe of Tacoma Community College. And they are going to talk to us about bugs. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. And their uh, seminar is titled Community Practice and Emergence. So um, Joe and um, Mary, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to set a timer. Okay. Is it 10 minutes? Yes. OK, we got it. All right, so ready, no, um, and so right, oh, sorry, right now I have your first. Yes, so right now we're looking at termites <laughs> over the water. It should be leaf cutting ants. There should be two ants carrying, each one carrying the leaf, and it should say emergence and community of practice on that. Yep, we're there. But it is, it is, okay, perfect. Yep. So we're, we're starting with that first um, slide. First of all, we want to invite all the people to think with us about the intentional commitment that comes with a community of practice. So um, our um, FLC is actually a, a community of practice. And we're asking folks to look at the difference between um, networks, which are more self-serving, and communities of practice that require commitment to purpose and to others. And we're framing um, our work around uh, Wheatley and Frere's um, ideas about uh, community. And so we use the theme of emergence to talk about, uh, in our faculty learning community, our community practice, 
the keys for us were self-organization, change, and how to deal with change that is generated around us, but we didn't necessarily um, uh, begin ourselves, and not top-down and emergent methods for dealing with change. How do we create? How do we learn together? And then how do we adapt? So our goal is, Mary will say more about this, but our goal is to share our discoveries eventually. And the questions that we ask ourselves and each member of our community is, why is this important to you? How does this impact your work? What has um, been your experience? So we're learning from one another's experience. And how do we work together to solve this dilemma or to find new solutions in an emergent way? And so what we're doing here, the reason we, you see the bug slides is that we have tried to find a metaphor that talks about the way that emergent systems, organic emergent systems, communicate with one another. So with a termite, who are the mound builders, they literally just bump into one another and they observe and they, they work together organically. So that's our metaphor. And our guiding questions in our dialogue go something like this. So um, we're going to talk about how we name, how we connect, how we nourish, how we illuminate. And so let's begin. <laughs> So Mary, when we first started, um, talk, talk a little bit about that naming practice in the community. Okay. Um, a little bit about our, um, our community of practice and who um, is involved. This is a group of, it started off as a group of about um, five or six um, Tacoma Community College teachers, staff, um, other people who are interested in um, writing and reaching out to our um, local high school community to reimagine how teaching and learning happens among all of us. We had about five or six, um, maybe more, um, people from Tacoma Community College and representatives from all of the um, local high schools, including the alternative school in Tacoma. So it's a group of 12 to 15 or so. When we first started, um, our name was, you know, the name of the group was something like um, the high school, college, uh, the transition project. And as we met and we talked and we got excited about the work we could do together and we really started learning from each other, at one point in about December of last year, um, we started calling ourselves the Comatopia. We were um, just thrilled to be doing something different and um, our project was, was uh, just really blossoming or ripening, um, you know, just kind of from the really from the ground up. Um, and then we had a couple of things happen. Um, Joe kind of um, talked about some top down or things that were out of our control. Um, things happened administratively where TCC was going through a lot of stuff, and um, and it, got, it became a little difficult for a, a month or two. Um, and this is when I realized um, that this, this is a community of practice. So then what did you do to nourish that community? One of the things we did was we, um, of course, we were meeting um, monthly at first. Now we're meeting every two weeks. Um, we're reading together. We're um, talking amongst each other, not you know, to each other, but amongst each other. We're eating, we're drinking. Um, and then, you know, I knew that this was working when in about January I was frustrated and a little depressed about the way some things were going on campus and I reached out to all of the group members, just sent out an email saying, is this worth it? You know, is this really something that's possible? Is, is our vision you know, really something that we can sustain and, and you know, actually work toward? And everybody almost emailed back immediately. Yeah, of course. You know, we, it doesn't matter what's going on. We, this, this is what we are, and we, we love this. Um, and so we got back together, um, and we are nourishing each other. We're, um, it's growing on its own. So how are you uh, reconnecting and catalyzing the group? What's happening in terms of those connections? 
well, you know, since we kind of hit a, uh, a tough spot, really the having the um, learning, learning community in place, I think, kind of saved our bacon. Um, I think it would be a little bit easy to quit um, or just, just kind of give up and say, maybe next year we'll try it again. Um, so, we, so I reached out, of course, you know, I'm the largest of the email list. I reached out to everybody and people were saying, yeah, we, we don't want to stop. We, you know, we, we want to keep going. And so we said, okay, let's even um, you know, meet more often. So instead of meeting monthly, now we're meeting every two weeks. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're inviting others who we think would like to come to our meetings. They're not necessarily part of our learning community per se, but I think you get new fees. Yeah, so there's um, you. Actually, last night was our, we had a, uh, a gathering last night. We had three people from the University of Washington, Tacoma, two from the University of Puget Sound, one from Evergreen, um, who are also very interested in just our vision and our goal of, kind of transforming the way the teaching and learning of writing is happening for all Tacoma students. So, you know, we just said, let's reach out to all the people we know who might want to be on this journey with us. This was an amazing gathering last night. So we're on to illumination, mm -hmm. and it would be lovely if we could, we can see the slides now, and we would like to just slowly click through those slides. You're going to see um, images of bridge building, mm -hmm. of, hu of ants, and we can think of humans connecting, sacrificing themselves to make sure that goals are met, working together, Working, carrying those leaves like Mary and I were at first, and but doing so in concert. There's more bridge building. And then you see other images like schools of fish. And then we, we have this one because we know that it's important to have all the diverse perspectives. And so we have this emergent system with diversity involved, and it's also quite beautiful, I think. And then uh, there are a couple of them of geese flying together, and our metaphor for that is, um, that is our metaphor for the fact that we've had times when we've had some discouragement, and with geese, if there's one that's having problems, at least one from the flock goes back and says, come on, you can do it. Yep. And so we, we have that experience as well. Yep. And then the other images, I'm just going to let you go ahead and click, if you will, to the end with the uh, mound building. And those, those mounds are built by termites. They're amazing feats of architecture that are imitated by human beings. So this is the closing slide, and I want to ask Mary, in terms of the last piece, which is illuminating, what is it that we're going to bring with our community to the rest of the, our system, to our college? What, what are we doing? Um, I'm actually stunned by what has grown out of this group. I'm just going to read you the seven pilot projects that we are, um, we all agreed last night that we really are committed to working on starting in the fall. Um, we are going to have a pilot project where definitely we work on, we build on the um, work of Green River, and we're really looking forward to um, working with them um, to do a transcript, um, using transcripts for assessment. And UW, it's not just PCC, UWT is super interested in working with us on this too, which of course means that for Tacoma students, this is not just a PCC thing. This is, a, this is this shows that we care deeply about them wherever they go. So we're gonna, oh, our time's up. Wow. Hang on and hear more later. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. And if everybody could just maybe give them some applause or a smiley face, like let's just use those emoticons, shall we? <laughs> and Kurt, um, I see. I see you have your hand up, but I'm going to ask if we could hold questions um, until the end, just to make sure that we all we get through everything. And then, um, and if you're if you're worried you might forget your question, just go ahead and type it into the chat window. And when we do the Q and A session, I'll be sure to I'll be sure to address that. So next, uh, oh, you hit it by mistake. Okay. <laughs> so next up we have um, Kate Noon Uvila, and she is going to talk to us about their cohort-based FLC. Um, so Kate, when you are ready, take it away.
or no? Kate? Um, <laughs> uh, oh, oh, they're saying, hang on. Oh, we cannot hear you, no. Can you hear me now? Oh, now we can okay. hear you. Okay, good, okay. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so, uh, my name is Kate Obala, and I'm also here with my colleague, Dina Rader, um, and she's actually the one who um, wrote the grant for us here. And we are both members of the LGBTQIA task force at Highline Community College. And so this year, we decided to start an LGBTQIA socially responsible staff and faculty learning community in order to create more awareness of LGBT issues on topics and make our campus more LGBT inclusive. And if you are wondering what LGBTQIA stands for, it is on the next slide. And it's L, lesbian, G, gay, B, bisexual, P, pansexual, T, transgender, Q, queer, questioning, I, intersex, identifying, A, asexual, or straight ally. Um, but I'm going to just refer to it as LGBT plus because it's a mouthful. So um, we started off the year with a presentation by Dr. Allison Lau and Dr. Gloria Coping on trans education. And this presentation talked about how what ana anatomical parts you are born with may not be the same as how you identify or choose to express yourself. And it covered common terminology around sex and gender as well as outlined the taxonomy of gender identity microaggressions. And we talked about how as a college we can support our gender non-conforming students and make them feel more comfortable and accepted. And this genderbred person is a wonderful graphic that really shows those concepts. Our next session included two parts. First, uh, by Natasha Burroughs, and she shared results from our LGBT plus climate survey that students answered questions about witnessing or hearing discriminatory LGBTQIA behavior towards staff, faculty, or students whether they were the culprit or the victim. Comfortability taking classes from an openly out LGBTQIA faculty member and taking classes with openly LGBTQIA students or taking classes at Highline that address the LGBTQIA community. And there were very mixed results from those surveys. Um, and then the next part of that session includes a presentation by Dr. Craig Heard McKenney on LGBT plus stereotypes in the media and how the media reinforces negative stereotypes of the LGBT plus community and how our students accept these stereotypes as true. And this included a discussion of what these stereotypes are and a detailed look at HBO's new show Looking and how the reviewers have labeled this show as reflected reality, which in fact it is not. In February, Allison Green facilitated a session on sexual and gender identity, what's yours and why it matters at Highline. And she talked about how students read us the moment we walk in the classroom or greet them at the front desk. How do we telegraph or not our sexual and gender identities? What assumptions do we think students make about us? Are we comfortable with those assumptions or would we like to challenge them? And if we do articulate sexual and gender identities that disturb or challenge some students' assumptions, what are the risks and what are the benefits? And there's a really great quote that came out of that session. And then in March, Josh Magliani facilitated a session on LGBT plus culturally responsive teaching. What does it mean to be culturally responsive? How does it look and how does it feel? And participants explored what it means to be a culturally responsive practitioner in and out of the classroom. Participants were provided examples like the ones you see here um, and techniques to adjust common pedagogy to allow for gender fluidity and gender cultural exclusion. And we explored our inner cultural change agents. And in April, I had the opportunity to attend the TESOL 2014 International Convention and English Language Expo in Portland, Oregon, where I met an amazing group of people who are part of the I as an international LGBT forum. And there I attended many sessions that focus on LGBT plus and ESL intersections, including a really powerful reader theater performance of LGBT instructors sharing their personal stories related to sexual and gender identity and English language teaching. And actually, a really interesting thing um, that just happened this week that, in fact, my colleagues don't know about is um, I was actually asked to present at next year's TESOL 2015 um, doing, um, they're really interested in the work that we've been doing at Highline with our LGBTQIA task force and also our SLC. Um, and a couple of years ago, we actually did a safe zone training specifically for our ESL department. And so they asked if I would present that 
um, and it might actually be their, their main session um, as part of the ILGBT forum at TESOL next year. So I'm really excited. That just happened yesterday. Thank you. <laughs> That's my colleagues clapping for me. Um, so the next one. Oh, there should be one before that. Okay. So our last official FLC session of the year was presented by our Career Straight Alliance students and faculty who attended the 2004 NASPA Power One Conference in Salt Lake City, Utah. And the student panel shared their personal experience and insights they gained from attending the conference and also what they would like to see happen on Highline's campus, which included more of an LGBTQ presence on campus, having an LGBTQ panel at faculty staff events, and having more LGBTQ community events on campus. And at the end of this month, all three of the faculty learning communities at Highline will host a reception for our, our administration to showcase what we've achieved. And you can't see it, but that is a graphic of those people clapping. Um, <laughs> and um, this will offer a chance for discussion. We're going to talk about what we learned, what additional support is needed, and our next step for the coming year. So in conclusion, um, throughout the year, there have been several reoccurring topics that have continued to come up. Um, the first one is that identity has many intersections. The second one is continued education is the key to creating an inclusive and safe environment. And the last one is acceptance is much more than just tolerance. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful job, Kate. And really, congratulations on being invited to present. That is amazing. And you definitely deserve it and wonderful. So thank you. And I see you're getting lots of applause. <laughs> so next up, we have um, Barbara Parker and Kathy Bright. And they're going to talk to us about um, their topic-based FLC. So Kathy, when you're ready, take it away. OK. So Barbara Parker is at a conference today and can't make it. Um, uh, she's medical technology faculty, and she did the presentation at Assessment Teaching and Learning Conference. I'm the e-learning administrator and a full-time faculty in the business management program. Our official long title for this FLC was transitioning a face-to-face -face course to a hybrid course using the Quality Matters rubric and best practices for blended learning. Jennifer, am I moving my slides or you? Um, would you like to move them, or would you like? I'm, I'm happy either way. I think I'll go. I'll go. Do it. Do it, sister. <laughs> okay. So the idea came from the um, fact that the first time I ever actually taught a hybrid course, I crashed and burned really bad. The course design was flawed. Students did not come to class prepared. And also, I've done a lot of quality matters work, a lot of reviews, and I have never seen a hybrid course go up for review. And I really knew and wanted to look at the differences between a hybrid and fully online. Um, our community involves a real variety of disciplines, literally from A to Z and in between. Um, we had an art instructor who worked with us and as part of our learning community ended up changing the design of our new art building that, so she could position a camera above her, um, you know, where they make pot, potter's wheel. <laughs> Um, and so that she could capture those demos because she felt it was much easier to put those up online to let students see those. And we had a Zumba instructor from our continuing ed department who wanted to use YouTube to prep students before they came to class and learn the moves, you know, on their own or at least see them. The questions that we addressed this year was how does faculty, how could faculty best use the quality matters rubrics in the design of their blended course? We wanted to look at what other best practices and standards beyond quality matters were applicable to blended, hybrid, or flipped classrooms. And we wanted to gauge, um, give instructors and faculty um, tools to gauge the quality of their own redesigned courses. Um, so we had to back up and actually define hybrid. Um, we found many names are used for this modality. Um, Sloan tends to use blended. We hear flipped. We hear flipped mixed mode and even high flex, which is kind of a newer term for me, it's a course that allows students to complete it fully online, face to face, or to reach their own balance of hybrid and um, independently and choose when they want to come to class and when they want to work online. A learning community, of course, always needs to look at best practices. We used a number of major sources, our own Center for Teaching and Learning collection, um, we went back to the old standard classroom assessment technique handbook, Magna, 20-minute mentors, and I'm going to talk more about that particular source. Uh, a lot of, several of us had gone to Sloan 
and done the blended workshop series. Um, we had a shared textbook, and of course we used a lot of quality matters rubrics and various workshops. And, and we gave members access to Canvas classrooms that were built or were in process of being built. And here's our book. This is the book that we selected. Our goal was to get a shared language by reading this book. What we were looking for was practical tips on course design. Unfortunately, it was a poor choice. Um, it ended up being more of a recap of research than an actual um, useful course design um, ideas. Our own library collection actually turned out to be more uh, useful to us. Okay, if there's just one tip I could share out with others, this is it. This is our service that our Center for Teaching and Learning signed up for this year. We have a one-year license, and it's access to pre-recorded uh, webinars. Um, by faculty from across the country. They're 20 minutes, some are 17, 18, 19 minutes, but they're all less than 20 minutes. And some of the topics I've got here on the slide are, were the ones that we used in conjunction with our faculty learning communities. The mentor sessions are excellent for starting dialogue. Um, basically, we would run one. First couple of times we did it, we ran straight through them and then we discussed them afterwards. And after doing that once or twice, what we did was enable everybody to interrupt the mentor session and start the discussion when they heard something that really intrigued them. Naturally, we use QM for a resource. Some opted to complete the basic APP QMR course instead of what we had intended to design your blended course, um, just because they felt they needed that background. The design your blended course had some wonderful tools that are used to design your course. We also had access to the faculty learning community at Olympic that's working on standard six and standard eight. So we did some cross um, sessions with them. So we had general quality matters information and what we really wanted to drill down on, on in quality matters was the standards that are different when you go hybrid. And these are the four. We're going to talk to each of those in a minute. Um, and this is my personal pet peeve, okay. All the standards on the previous slide relate to standard one. Standard one cannot be met if your Kansas class starts out with a recent activity page. So that's my e-learning coming in there. Okay, so the first standard that we looked at, 1.1, um, making clear to, stand, to students the format of the class. We had actually 20-minute mentors that worked with this one. Um, it was a segment on how to um, make it clear to the students that the, what the format was and to help get students prepared for when they came to class to do the activities. That's a really a big issue and the one that I failed on the first time I did hybrid. The second session we did, again, used a 20-minute mentor. Um, so as we designed our courses, you say to yourself, well, you know, what's logical to put online? What's logical to bring to the classroom? And then you share that logic with the students so they understand why you split the class and why they're to do those activities outside the classroom. Okay. We talked about pre-recording. Um, your instruction, your Self-introduction, very important. Even though you do that in the classroom, you still want to make that available to students at a later time. We talked about posting student introductions. Again, something you might do in the classroom, but want to do it again so people can go back and reference those. Our favorite meeting format, um, that's always a struggle with learning communities and busy schedules. It turned out to be an extended session on Fridays where we would do a 20-minute mentor we would discuss it, we would have lunch, and then we'd either present on a topic or do another 20-minute mentor session. This allowed people to drop in and participate in what they could. Uh, we made some mistakes. Some of the interested faculty were lower on the technology scale than I had expected when I put the grant together. My personal involvement was a mistake because most people see me as the trainer and expected me to take the lead. Um, and I already mentioned our book, which we probably should have researched better before we chose that as the, as the common text. Some of the things that are our favorite presentations then. Um, this particular slide presentation is a mix of that. I saw presentations then with Joe Monroe and the, their presentation with, where you just use the images. And I really want to go with that more when I do presentations. We talked about slot. I don't think people at assessment, teach, and learning understand that concept. We didn't explain it very good. The QM standard 3.5 says you need to give students examples of good ex assignments. The slot idea is that a better way or a, a way that they can also see what you want is to show them what you don't want. So they can compare a good assignment next to a bad assignment, and that's really a better message for them. 
And then flexibility is important with your students, with your technology, and of course with Zumba. We love this. The group wanted to share this quote with you. The reason we use hybrid and why hybrid works is mostly students don't want to listen to us lecture for two hours anymore. And to let you know, we're not done exploring the academic freedom that you get with hybrid. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And if we could all applaud um, virtually. Um, thank you, Kathy, so much. That's, and it's interesting, too, seeing these presentations the second time, like things that I didn't notice before. So thank you so much. This is great. All right, Christy, um, I gave you guys moderator privileges. And you should be able to show us your desktop through application sharing and show us your presentation. Amber wants a duck horse, yes. All right, cool. Let me application. Your desktop? <clears throat> Not yet. Go back then. I just made it. Got rid of you guys. Which presenter is, is Troy Dasher? Um, so this is Christy Knighton of Highline, and so she wants to uh, she wants to show us her presentation in um, in a different format than PowerPoint. So she's trying to load application sharing. So I just went application sharing. Yeah, it says that we're sharing. It says stop sharing on our end. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stop sharing. And then I'm going to do it again. Application sharing. I did share entire desktop. Oh, there. It looks oh, like it's working. working. You can see that? Yes. yes. Or we can. It's it's okay. Now we can see it. Yay! Fantastic. All right. So here we are. So I'm Christy Knighton at uh, Highline, and I am here and with. And I'm Moy Fulton at Highline. And um, three years ago, we planted the seed of reading apprenticeship at our college. And that was a direct result of hearing about reading apprenticeship at one of the ATL conferences that year. We nurtured the seed on campus for three years. And this brief presentation is going to show you the spiral of experience and growth. Uh, it's going to explain the journey and how it all began. We heard about reading apprenticeship, we'll call it RA, at the ATL conference in the spring of 2020. Immediately, we begged our VP to send two faculty to the RA training in California that summer. We are so excited. We went to California for the three days. It was an intensive training, um, but we did come back steeped in RA framework theory and practice. And we noticed that there was faculty from all disciplines that attending that training. And that inspired us coming back to Highline. Our mission when we got back was to recruit faculty in various disciplines to take the online reading apprenticeship course, a six-week course. We begged our VP again for money for this, and again he said yes. 24 tech faculty on our campus have taken that course. So in spring, we had a big meeting with our VP to plan for the 2013-14 school year. Uh, we wanted to engage our uh, 24 trained faculty and also train more faculty and staff. Uh, the rest of the presentation will uh, be part of the presentation. You're going to hear more about how we got release time or FSLC or one day training with our institute, all of those things that are coming up. Um, yeah, sorry. Here we go. Last summer, we sent, sent two faculty to, to the train the trainer program for RA. It's an intense week of deeper RA study and learning to train others. It's required if schools want to use RA's well researched materials for professional development on their campuses. So we came back all enthused. We had a session during our opening week and a half day session at our professional development day. We started our FSLC with twice a month meetings and we were doing this to really plant the seeds across campus uh, and that was also leading to our next big event. This winter we gave a one day training attended by multiple campuses and a community organization. It was led by an reading apprenticeship expert from California, and Highline and Pierce faculty who had done the Train the Trainers program. We ran a Winter Institute with nine hours of training for faculty, for our faculty and staff, and we continued with an FSLC. 
sadly, though, we found that their FSLC was really lightly attended, and it was a big mix of faculty. And we did find that the large blocks of time for our institutes was a more effective way to train faculty, so we continued. For fall quarter, we created a new course um, called Reading Across the Disciplines, Read 120. Each week, different college faculty already trained in RA will teach a session using reading material from their discipline and using RA routines. This will support students and nurture faculty in RA. It's a great incubator project. So our next steps, we want to collect data from classes that are using RA and use that to help fund future projects. Uh, we also want to be focusing on STEM for 2014 and 15. Looking back, we've identified seven big ideas that helped us and might help others. The first one is that we learned it takes a lot of time to get the ball rolling. And it also can be a bumpy road. And sometimes you may feel like you're even on a sinking ship. But we're here to tell you, you will eventually get to smooth sailing. The idea number two is that administrative support means everything. We're lucky to have a VP that's supportive and generous in funding our online classes and providing stipends for faculty attending our institute. Big idea number three is uh, we have a team for our implementation uh, and our base of RA on our campus is our college level faculty. So the team approach, but yet the, the content or college level really being the base. Big idea number four includes student services. Train everyone, everywhere students have contact, such as tutoring and writing centers, disability services, counseling, MESA, Veterans Affairs, etc. Big idea number five, we found, uh, like I said earlier, that the big chunks of time were more effective. We had uh, three sessions of three hours, and this really helped us build a strong foundation for RA. Six, dream big and always ask. Think outside the box when planning. Always ask for more. Example, our college has always had only summer institutes, and now we have winter and spring institutes just for RA training. Big idea number seven is work with neighboring colleges. Uh, two heads are always better than one. It's a great way to share resources and increase networks. And I think that's it. So we just wanted to say thanks to ACL. Yeah. Oh, wonderful job. And I'm just, I'm applauding you. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. So could we go ahead and um, and open the floor for questions? And it, people can either speak into their microphones or they could just type their questions into the chat window. No questions? Oh, I see Kurt and Liz are typing. So we have a question from Liz Falconer. Reading across the disciplines is for faculty and students. Uh, Christy and Moira, do you guys want to take this one? Can you hear us? Yes. Yep. Oh, good. Um, yeah, it's going to be a two-credit class that we're going to offer for students in the fall. But the faculty that will be teaching it um, will, be, will be in the classroom, but each week there will be a different faculty member from a different discipline using reading materials from their discipline using RA routine. And these are faculty that have already been trained, uh, either have gone through our institute or the online class. Thank you. Thank you. And I, um, I can see other people are typing. And Liz might have a follow-up comment or question. Um, so Oh, Kurt says, where is the application itself? Um, Kurt, I'll post that to this. And Liz is asking a follow-up question. So the focus is on reading methods. Um, Christy, do you guys want to take this one? Sure. It's, it's, on, it's using really, so the, the gist of reading apprenticeship is metacognitive problem solving. And the routines that are involved with RA are allowing students to focus on that, to be able to get into content that they may not be successful with. So the focus is on reading and reading across different disciplines. Very nice. Um, Debbie of Renton Technical College is asking, what is the role of the college library in working with and supporting reading apprenticeship on campus? 
we have um, uh, some of our librarians have been through the um, training, and so they're familiar with working with students. We'd like to have all the librarians trained. We're not at that point yet. I, I uh, witnessed a librarian that was working with one of my classes, and the things that she was doing, if you're familiar with RA, was really doing this think aloud when um, it was, it's for one of my high school science students. They were looking at this website that was really daunting for the student, and so this librarian just started thinking aloud, okay, when I first, when I would look here, this is what I'm first looking at, is she's trying to see if it's a credible source. So that's just an example of how a librarian could be using it. So it's really wherever faculty or staff are interacting with students around reading, having that training and that background can help them help the students. It's been surprising to me to hear from so many staff people how valuable it's been to them when they work with students. I, I didn't realize how frequently staff have contact with students with their reading material, but advisors have said to me, you know, I made contact with a student when I was advising them, and now they come back to me for help sometimes and ask for help with their reading. I was shocked at that, but it's really helpful to have everybody on campus trained in this. So I'm seeing a few a few comments. Um, so Liz is saying, or Kurt Warmington is saying, I took an initial training in reading apprenticeship, and it was very good. And Liz says, nice to um, include everyone. Um, and Debbie has included um, the website with info about reading apprenticeship um, from Renton Technical College. So Debbie, thank you for that. Um, and it looks like, um, Greg, it looks like you might be typing, aha, here we go. Um, how often did the various groups meet? What did you find effective, biweekly or monthly? And I'm going to turn off my talk button. Um, oh, it looks like Kathy. Um, so if people could either weigh in um, orally or if they could maybe type in a response. So Christy says twice a month until we move to the institutes, okay, um, right, because you guys weren't getting strong enrollment. Joe says twice a month from Tacoma. Thanks, Joe. Um, and the LGBTQ plus met once a month. Good, good. Thank you for that information. Great question, Greg. Um, other questions? Oh, Joe added, started once a month, uh, not as effective for community building. Um, Joe is actually um, an expert on, a nationally recognized expert on the Milk Cox model and on faculty learning communities and communities of practice. Joe, do you, um, do you have any advice about frequency of meetings um, for people? <laughs> to have any dogma to share, you mean? Um, I really do believe it has to be uh, at least twice a month. And yeah, uh, Liz put on here for two to three hours, and I would say at least for two hours, twice monthly is is probably optimal. Uh, there are some communities here, uh, one in the transitional studies area, that decided to meet once every three weeks, and they generated community and they sustained it. Uh, there's a community of practice that we have that doesn't meet um, as uh, frequently. Uh, I think that they are down to once every three weeks. But they have an online presence and they uh, establish the face-to-face -face community first. And I would just advocate for getting off campus as much as you possibly can and changing it up so that it's not like business as usual. And at first people will think they don't have time and it does seem to really make a difference in forming community. So those are the things that I would say are pretty well tried and true best practices. Thanks, Joe. That's really helpful. Uh, <laughs> thank you. And I took the liberty of typing up some highlights just so it's sort of preserved in the chat window. Um, and Greg says thank you. That's very helpful. I agree. Um, other questions or comments or thoughts? I would say if you're really planning to do a learning community that you think about it as that kind of thing that is intentionally uh, commit, commitment-oriented 
And sometimes people try to sort of cajole folks into joining a community. And I would say that a learning community is for people who find some real purpose and meaning in collaborating interdependently. Like their project wouldn't work without it, or they thrive better in that environment. Um, sometimes people try to pull people into them, and it doesn't work out as well, I think. Um, Joe, I'm just writing that out. A learning community is for people who find purpose and meaning in working collaboratively. I was like, how do I spell collaboratively? Um, I think that's that's very beautiful, especially as we do head into this application season <laughs> about finding people, you know, and really finding topics that really do need to be addressed from a collaborative perspective. That's excellent. And I see that Kurt is typing. So perhaps he has another a follow up question or a comment. Um, and I see Kathy has a hand up. Yeah, Jeff Thompson and I also talked about this. We're both kind of professional development. That's how people on campus know us. And we didn't feel that we made very good facilitators because people expected us to take the burden of planning and preparing because that's what we do in our normal job. And if we compare that, you've got on the slide our mindfulness group. They actually switched off leadership much better than Jess and I were able to do in our learning community. So that's my tip. We're, Jess and I are actually going to step back and let that collaboration happen between faculty at, at that level rather than, you know, having an, an administrator or a professional development staff person get involved. That's very wise advice, Kathy. And, um, you know, and, and actually that's something that I'll be talking to people about, you know, that that um, that facilitator role, like who should be, or not who should be the facilitator, but just that particular struggle with facilitation is a, is a very interesting one. So thank you for that. Um, Kurt is asking a question about the actual application. And Kurt, um, I actually addressed this in the actual FLC application webinars. And so I'm glad that you asked it here, too, because I think it's important to note that we do fund, I mean, clearly we fund um, FLCs from multiple institutions, and we do judge them on the merits of the application. Um, you know, so feel free to go ahead and support and, and apply, you know, multiple from multiple colleges. Don't feel like, oh, we can only submit one from Highline or one from Olympic. Um, Kathy, I see, is this your hand up from previous, or do you have another comment or question? Oh, no, no worries. <laughs> go down. <laughs> no worries here. I'll uh, I'll lower your hand. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to go ahead and um, just promote the next FLC on. Um, so the next FLC webinar will look. We'll have another from Highline and two more from Olympic. Um, improving the transition from college to workforce with technology, using mindfulness practice to enhance teaching and learning. This was standing room only um, at the ATL. Um, it was packed, so I'm very excited. I couldn't attend because I was presenting at the same time. So I'm very excited to hear what they did. And then Jess Thompson, um, uh, ca um, Kathy's professional development colleague from Olympic is going to talk about achieving quality matters standards in online learning through the lens of accessibility. And um, she'll have some great points to share with us about accessibility in this shifting landscape. Um, I also wanted to address some future resources. Um, so Joanne has authored um, a chapter in a book, Developing Learning Communities at Two-Year Colleges. It's called Assessment Incognito, Design Thinking and the Studio Learning FLC. Um, she, also, um, she also recommended a particular book by Milt Cox, who has, is her mentor and an absolute authority on um, faculty learning communities. Um, so his book is Faculty Learning Communities Change Agents for Transforming Institutions into Learning Organizations. And that, um, it looks like that's in a book called To Improve the Academy. Um, so that's there. There's also um, a website for developing faculty and professional learning communities. And then um, this is a book 
um, that, that that website recommended, Building Faculty Learning Communities. So this link would take you to the purchasing details on Amazon. And Joe um, wrote me detailed recommendations for initiating, initiating and continuing faculty learning communities can be found in Cox. And Joe, if you're willing, would you mind typing your email address into <laughs> the chat window? I definitely think if you're interested in getting really high quality, um, Joe's very busy, but if you're interested in getting really high quality consulting, <laughs> um, oh, for she, what? <laughs> I said for free. <laughs> she, well, she's fabulous. Maybe not for free, but she's fabulous. So um, I definitely look to her for a lot of wisdom and expertise on these things. And it looks like um, Jerry is offering that Northwest eLearn will be doing a webinar in the hour before the next IGNIS webinar. And this is creativity in the silent in the in the science classroom. Wow, <laughs> online and face to face with Lucas Myers of Lower Columbia. Um, and Lucas presented at our first IGNIS webinar on flipping, and he's a great presenter. Um, so Kurt says, "Is this list available?" And Kurt, I'll be sending this. Um, I'll be sending this out through the ATL listserv and posting it as um, a blog entry to the ATL blog. And uh, Jo has posted her email address. Thank you, Jo. Thank you so much. And um, I'm just going to put my contact information and Alyssa Sell's contact information. So if you want to follow us on Twitter. And then finally, uh, we have us, especially for those of you um, who have attended today and then those who are watching this webinar in the future um, as a recording, we do have a survey link here. And if you would consider um, going and filling out this survey, we would really appreciate your feedback on the webinars. And for some reason, it's not letting me. I was going to post it into the chat window, and I'm, I'm struggling a little bit here. So I'll send, when I send out the Collaborate recording, I'll send out the URL for the survey. And if you would mind um, giving, us our feed, giving us feedback, we would really appreciate it. Um, Joe is asking, how long will it be available? Um, is that the, the, survey monkey, the survey monkey link, Joe? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, so I'll send that out through the ATL to serve, and it will be available pretty much forever. Because actually, I was looking at my blog today, and Collaborate recordings, I think, have been opened 300 times on my website. And we've been posting them since January. So people are definitely, oh, Amber posted the SurveyMonkey link. So even if you could do that like right now before you forget, um, any feedback would be helpful. And there's especially um, a section on there if you're interested in doing a webinar for next year, if you would be, we'd love to, we'd love to talk to you about that. So definitely fill us out. Fill us let us know. Fill us in. There we go. I need <laughs> some afternoon coffee, clearly. Um, I want to say thank you again to our presenters. And thank you again to Amber for attending today and providing such wonderful um, tech support. And to our great participants for asking such great questions. And I'm just really honored to be part of this. Um, I'm really humbled by the work that our faculty are doing across the system. And I'm just, I'm humbled. So thank you. Yes, and great presentations. I, so thank you. All right, everyone. I'm going to hang out a little bit in here if you want to stick around and chat, um, if you have more questions about the FLC applications. Um, and if not, I'll see you next Thursday. Okay, thank Bugs you. rock, yes. <laughs> thanks, Kathy.